Good morning. Welcome to Kaaba Park Church. We are glad that you could join us here on this Lord's Day, and especially this day as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, to prepare us towards that end, as we come to worship Him, let's look at God's Word in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6 for our scripture of meditation this morning. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you to worship you this day, this Resurrection Sunday, as your children, that you have risen from the dead through the same power that rose your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead over 2,000 years ago. And it is through this life that we are empowered to come and worship you in spirit and in truth, and in the presence of your son who is with us this morning in his spirit. God, we thank you for your willing sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And that in his resurrection, all of our sin, past, present, and future, was cast on him. And that the penalty for that sin was paid through his blood and death. And that through faith and faith in him alone, we can stand before you unafraid. Lord, we praise you that your son, Jesus Christ, is the resurrection and the life. And that by our union with him, we have been raised to life. We pray that by the power of Christ that has manifested itself in us, that we would be your living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, not only during this time of worship this morning, but in all aspects of our lives, that by this power that is within us, we would exude the fragrance of Christ to a world that is in desperate need of you. Father, we pray that you would accept this hour of worship from us as a gift to you, as a response to the gift that you have given us in Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For it is in your name, the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that we pray all these things. Amen. We are thankful that it is God himself who calls us to come and worship him this morning from his word. And we see him calling his people to come and worship him in Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And it says, Then I looked... And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen.
Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man, in his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. mystery Christ the Lord upon a tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace and We have the privilege this morning of coming before the Lord to confess to Him our sins, and we have a passage from His Word this morning to help us towards that end. And we see this in Luke chapter 24, verses 38 through 40, as the Lord Himself says, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Here recently, over the past few weeks and the past few months, uh, we have been testing our faith in many, many ways. And perhaps even at our weakest points, we have doubted the goodness of God. Uh, doubted whether he really loves us. Doubted whether he really cares about uh, what is going on in our lives. But thanks be to God's word and also to his spirit that testifies to the truth of this word that we are called back to be reminded that God does care, that God is good, and he has shown his love to us through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. So in light of that, in light of our doubts and the weakness of our faith, let us now go to the Lord now and uh, confess our sins before him. And after a few short moments of silent confession, I will pray for us together. Let us now bow our heads. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning as people who are 
weaken our faith. But Lord, we look to your son, Jesus Christ, who is not only the author of our faith, but is also the perfecter of our faith. And Lord, we acknowledge to you that uh, in these times in particular, these hardships that we are facing, uh, times of loneliness, times of uncertainty, times of anxiety, that the Lord is in the midst of that. Uh, that he is working all things together for good for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. And because of that, we can take great heart that he is using these things uh, for your glory and for our good. So, Lord, now we pray that you would strengthen our faith and help us to realize that you are using these things for your glory and for our good. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can look up with me. As we see the assurance of pardon in Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 49, as our Lord says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. was lost in darkest night yet though I knew the way the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will and if you had not left
One of the things that we know from God's word is, is that he desires to hear the cares and concerns from his people, uh, we, his children. And in the light of that great, wonderful truth, let us now go to the Lord with our cares and our concerns now. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege of coming to you with our request and that you as our loving father are never put off by them. You never roll your eyes at us. And we know from your word that you hear and honor our requests based upon your infinite wisdom and resources and out of a desire for your glory and, and for our good. We come to you as a very vulnerable, confused, and weary people in this time and place in history. We are living in isolation for many people we love and cherish. We are concerned about the means through which we make our livings to provide for ourselves and those who depend upon us. We are concerned about our health and the health of others, whether they may become sick or whether they already are. We know that you care about these things, and we praise you for the way in which you have already shown up to meet uh, these needs in some measure. We thank you that even though we may be lonely, that because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are never, ever alone. And we thank you that even though things may, may seem tight and uncertain from an income standpoint, you are still continuing to meet our needs. And indeed, you have already met our greatest need through your son, Jesus Christ, and that is that you have met our need for righteousness. And we thank you for the many men and women in the healthcare field who are working tirelessly to, to prevent the further spread of uh, this virus around this globe. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for those that you have gifted, uh, not only in terms of the way in which you have created them, but also the way in which you have provided training for them to, as they seek a, a cure and a vaccine for this disease. And Lord, also for those men and women who have been trained and gifted by you to, to treat those who are suffering from this. God, we pray that you would be with them, that you would sustain them, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them protection from this. And, and Lord, that, uh, that you would use them in a great and mighty way to, uh, to bring you glory and to be good for your people. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to whom we belong both body and soul, both in life and in death and that he has fully paid for all our sins with his precious blood, and that he has set us free. We pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for being here with us uh, this morning. And as such, we would like to have a record of your attendance so that we can follow up with you. And as such, there is a link at the bottom of your screen in the graphic below. And as you have opportunity, we would ask you to go to that and register your attendance with us today. Happy Easter, friends. Christ is risen and he is risen whether we are gathered together in this room together or whether we are scattered apart in our living rooms or back porches. Uh, Christ is risen. I wonder if I could just take a few moments and just speak to you very candidly. Uh, March 15th changed a lot on that day for Cobble Park Church and for all the churches uh, in the Birmingham area. Our president declared a national state of emergency our governor shut down schools statewide, and Jefferson County Department of Health issued a proclamation uh, requiring uh, those gatherings uh, to not exceed 25 people that could not maintain at least six feet apart. And then, of course, we know that those have even come down from there down to uh, gatherings of 10 and now to even a shelter in place, which means we had to move every in-person church event uh, online, and that included worship. In some ways, I would say it was an easy decision because we had to make it. Uh, in other ways, it was a terribly difficult and disruptive thing. It's disrupted our normal flow, flow of worship, our rhythm of seeing each other, but I recognize that it hasn't just disrupted those things. It's disrupted uh, our social lives. We can't see each other. 
uh, makes it difficult to get together with extended family and friends. It's disrupted our work routine. We can't maybe go into the places of business or operate our businesses in the way that we used to. It's disrupted our time in our home, whether that means you live alone or in a family, those different dynamics are at play. I know that it's disrupted those things. It's virtually disrupted every aspect of our life. And here we are, Easter Sunday, a typical Sunday where not only our church is fill, filled, but also all the churches around the country and indeed the world are filled. Uh, Easter Sunday, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to just ask this really pressing question today of the text. Uh, does what hope does the resurrection offer the Christian? Today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 53, Luke 24, 36 through 53. And I think what we're going to see in that text is, is that question answered. What hope does the resurrection offer Christians? Because if, if because of the resurrection, we, we only mean there's eternal life, meaning, meaning the, the, the only for lack of a better word, benefit for the Christian is eternal life and that everything else on this world, in this life, until we get to that moment is just a kind of a grin and bear it kind of thing, that that means that this virus and the difficulties that we're experiencing in this disruption in our lives is really significant. But what if I told you that the resurrection isn't just about our eternal home, though it is about our eternal home. But the resurrection has real impact for how we live today. You see, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ changes everything. Uh, the first thing that I want to draw your attention to uh, is that it brings us peace in the midst of chaos. Look at the text, verse 36. And as they, that's the disciples, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they thought that they saw a spirit. Now, I just, I want you to, Put yourself in place of the disciples. It's been three days since they've seen Jesus uh, or interacted with him in, in person from the crucifixion. Uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, the book that we're in now, describes it in more of a narrative fashion. The Gospel of John kind of gives it to us in a chronological fashion. The Gospel of John tells us that it's, it's on the night that Jesus rose that he enters into this room and not just enters into this room, but we learn the disciples are huddled there together in fear because of the Jews and they've locked the door. So I want you to just put yourself in their shoes. It's been three days since they've seen uh, the person that they've left everything for. They've left their jobs. They've left their families. Uh, they left social standing. They've, they've encountered persecution, ridicule, all kinds of difficulty. And now their leader is dead. He's been dead for three days and they presume all is lost. How would you feel? You'd be terrified. You had lost your job. You'd even be afraid of death. And it is in the midst of that, in the midst of that seeming chaos that Jesus appears to his disciples and says, peace. How can he do that? How can he say peace and chaos? Because what it seems to be chaos all around the disciples is actually orchestrated by God, allowed by him through his eternal and unchanging plan. 
Nothing that day surprised him. Nothing took him by surprise. Nothing caught him off guard. Nothing left him wringing his hands, wondering what happens next. It was all according to his eternal plan. And because it's not chaos, he can say, in the midst of what seems like chaos to them, peace. And so I say to you, ministering in Christ's name, peace. You have peace in chaos. You may be feeling in some ways like some of these disciples Frightened, wondering about what happens with your job, wondering about what happens with some kind of social standing, even wondering about your very life. And what may seem like chaos is order exactly as God would have planned. You have peace in chaos. And not only do you have peace in chaos, but as you begin to comprehend that. Perhaps you, you're, you're doubting a little bit. And if you're doubting, uh, then you're not unlike the disciples because they do too. And in the midst of their doubt, we see not only do we have peace and chaos, the first, um, the first uh, important element for us to consider as a practical benefit of the resurrection, but assurance and doubt. So peace and chaos Assurance and doubt. Look at the disciples' own doubt. They're startled. They're frightened. Verse 37 and verse 38, he says to them, perceiving what's going on in their hearts, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieving for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. We have assurance in doubt. The disciples, even in the midst of their doubt, they have assurance in doubt. Now, I want you now to put yourself in the place of Jesus. You've been leading this group of disciples for three years. Yes, they've left everything, but at their very uh, best, they have doubted you. And at their very worst, they have betrayed you and scattered and fleed at your crucifixion. And now, even now, even though you promised them over and over and over that you would rise again from the dead on the third day, and even now, as they see and behold you, they doubt. What would you do? Uh, I can remember distinctly teaching my son how to play basketball when he was very young. We got a basketball goal uh, and set it up in uh, new concrete in, uh, next to the driveway and lowered it almost as low as it could possibly go and got out there in the driveway and he would shoot and miss over and over and over. Now, how would I respond Throw up my hands in frustration. How come you're missing like this? I get the rebound and I hand him the ball. I say, here, son, let's go again. I, I think this part of the passage is so kind of Jesus because he doesn't blast his disciples for their doubt. Instead, he meets them where they are and he gives them assurance in the midst of their doubt. He gives them assurance through his physical resurrection. Look at what he says. He invites them first to hear him. Why are you troubled? Hear my voice. Why are you troubled? Why did doubts arise in your hearts? Then he invites them to look at him, to use their eyes, to see his physical body, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Then he invites them to feel him, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones of you have seen them. Then he invites them to eat with him. Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. The physical 
uh, evidence of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ he uses to assure them of their doubts. And friends, as, as we read this text and as we say to ourselves, okay, right, we, we, we're meant to have peace in, the, in chaos, that the resurrection actually serves to not just benefit us in the life to come, but in the life that is now. And that means peace in chaos. But, but what happens when I doubt? That you have assurance even in the midst of your doubts. Where can you go? If you doubt, I, I, I like to go to the Psalms. The Psalms are so very practical because they meet us in every way. They display every kind of human emotion and encourage us that we have a God who is mighty and powerful and big enough, even in the midst of our doubts, that we have assurance in our doubts. But not only do we have assurance in our doubts, we have fellowship with God, peace and chaos assurance and doubt, fellowship with God. That's the third benefit of the resurrection that we see practically here. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. That, that the resurrection actually brings fellowship with God. And the way that we normally think about fellowship with God is in the eternal sense. Yes, we do in fact have eternal fellowship with God. And that means that in the, in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, he defeated sin and death forever and ever. And that means that we have the promise of everlasting life with him. No virus can take that from us. No government can take that from us. Nothing can take that from us. But not only do we have eternal fellowship, but we have real lasting fellowship with God today. That's what he means when he opens their eyes to understand the scriptures that everything written about him and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And you can just imagine what it would have been like for him to open the disciples' eyes so that they would understand the scriptures. And we have that same ability that Christ himself speaking to us through the power of the Holy Spirit opens his word to us. What would he reveal to them? God's redemptive plan in history, how all things work together for the good of those who know God, who are called according to his purpose, that further God's purposes, that that means that you have fellowship with God by and with his word. And that's a real lasting promise of the resurrection that that while the world may seem to be in chaos, that you can have peace. And even when you doubt that the Lord is kind enough and merciful enough to assure you in the midst of your doubt, and how does he do it? Through fellowship with him in his word. Do you see how it's all beginning to weave together? That while, while there's chaos, that we have peace, the promise of peace. And in the midst of the promise of peace, even though we doubt it, he assures us. And how does he assure us? Through fellowship with him in his word. Which leads us, of course, to the next thing that the benefit of the resurrection, which is strength for obedience. Strength for obedience is described to us in verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The promise of the Father is the person of the Holy Spirit. We learn about the Holy Spirit uh, first in the ministry of Jesus through uh, the prophecy of John the Baptist, when he speaks of one that comes after him who will, uh, who will baptize with fire, with the Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, involves a lot, but primarily these two things. 
awakening us to see our sin and enabling us to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. So that, that, that saving faith and then that sanctifying faith, that ongoing uh, becoming more and more like Jesus as the things that we love become more like the things that Jesus loves. So saving faith, both, both in that initial and in that ongoing saving faith, that's one ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then other ministry of the Holy Spirit is enabling obedience to him, enabling us to actually act more like Jesus. And in this case, the command that Jesus gives to his disciples is to be witnesses for him. I don't know about you, but I found one of the most profoundly surprising uh, side effects or uh, results of being quarantined at home. Uh, and is the, is the surprising safe distancing, kind of social distancing relationship that we have with those that we see when we go on walks or uh, runs with our neighbors the opportunity to pray for them, to encourage them, for them to encourage us. May we be so bold as to be witnesses for him and have strength for obedience through the power of the Spirit. So just thinking practically, what does the resurrection mean for the Christian? What practical hope does it have for us today? It means that we have peace and chaos and even when we doubt, we have assurance in the midst of the doubts. And the way that he provides assurance is through the witness of his testimony, through fellowship with God and his word, which then strengthens us in our inner person to have obedience, to respond to him in obedience, which leads to the final thing I will say today. Joy in every circumstance. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means joy in every circumstance. Listen to what it says here in verse 50. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. We see joy in, in every kind of circumstance. We see joy in the disciples as he is uh, departing from them, uh, ascending into heaven. They're worshiping him as he uh, leaves them. We see joy even in the midst of their return to Jerusalem. Now, we need to recognize nothing has changed for the setting in Jerusalem for the disciples. The same bad guys that caused them to lock their doors are the same bad guys that are still there. In fact, Acts, the book of Acts tells us that that persecution ramps up even more and more and more. But look at what it says. They return to Jerusalem with great joy. They're, they're, they're not, it, it, it's like they're not even afraid of death anymore. And we ask ourselves, how can that be? How can they have joy even in the face of death. I don't know what this virus will do. And uh, I don't know how long it will last. No one does. And I find it so tragically... Uh, Sad, it's not even the best word for it, difficult. That what the health organizations and governments are telling us is that the, the peak deaths will happen on Easter Sunday, according to some outlets. How can Christians not be afraid of even death? Paul puts words to Jesus' uh, words, commentary to Jesus' words. In Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, 
who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is in, indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall separation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of the resurrection, that means that we need not fear even our greatest enemy, death itself. Because if our greatest enemy, death itself, has been defeated, then the very worst that thing can happen is that we die and go be with the Lord. That nothing can separate us from his love. And that what that does is it creates a deep-seated, un quenchable, unmovable joy. Look how it translates here. They were continually in the temple blessing God. Friends, as we're scattered and as we await Christ's return, may our hearts be filled with hope because of the resurrection of our risen Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Heavenly Father, you did not allow death to have the final word, but in your great mercy and kindness, not only delivered your son over to the cross, but raised him from the dead. And because you raised him from the dead, you defeated sin and death forever. And that brings us peace and chaos, assurance in doubt, fellowship with you, strength for obedience, and joy in every circumstance. In short, it gives us hope. And hope does not disappoint because it's founded on you. So fill our hearts with resurrection hope this day. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my heart. Is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine 
I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd. Sure, sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hope my sin has been defeated. Jesus. Friends, would you stand and stretch out your arms as you are able? Now may the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ fill your hearts with hope in him and keep our eyes focused upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below. 